Um, I don't uh, like to bring politics into this, but of course we have uh, Trump in the White House, and we had Scott Pruitt. Right. Uh, with, was the Obama administration a little bit more diligent as far as the EPA was concerned and uh, their findings? And No. <laughs> no. I mean, my research, these Freedom of Information documents, and, you know, a lot of them came during the Obama administration. You see, when Obama came in, he did try to um, put in a new scientific integrity policy to protect, the, presumably to protect government scientists who were trying to, you know, bring out information that is not necessarily good news for big corporations. Um, because there's, this problem has gone on for decades through Republican and Democrat administrations where the big powerful companies essentially control the science that happens inside the agency. So he put in place this policy and they talked a good game. Um, but the scientists that I've talked to and that have been polled, um, there's a group that represents public employees, public scientists in Washington, and they, you know, talk to these people all the time and they do anonymous polling and they said it really hadn't gotten much better, unfortunately. You see, this is not a feel-good story. It's not. Sorry, okay, anybody else? Yes, hi, thank hi. you very much for this presentation. You. Can you speak at all to uh, local exterminators and the spraying for mosquitoes and the rights of uh, my neighbor, you know, this summer sprayed her whole yard and it covered my, you know, beautiful little garden. Yeah. And then I went to like wash it off and I'm like, all right, I'm washing it off in the soil, so it's still growing. Do we have any rights regarding that? And, and the spraying overhead from the planes for the mosquitoes. Right. I mean, that's really scary. The aerial spraying, I mean, you're going to see that probably more if you live in an agricultural or rural community. Um, you know, my brother and his little babies um, live right next to a farm field, which is, there's aerial spraying going on all the time. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I see more and more people doing that, being aware, like you're talking about, and you go over and you say, what are you spraying? You know, whether it's the city guy coming around or your neighborhood guy, or you know, what are you spraying? You know, I need to know that. Do you know, you know, what are the wind conditions? What is the temperature? Is it volatizing? Is it drifting, right? It was, <laughs> is it organic? Is it not? I mean, there are um, different alternatives. There's, a, there's a, a growth industry right now for, um, organic um, or bio-friendly landscaping companies for commercial as well as residential. And they, it's, you know, I'm not an expert on this, but when I talk to them, they explain, you know, it depends on what you plant and native plants and, and the different diversity you bring in with the insect population and how they can interact to control, you know, plant diseases and weeds and insect problems and things. So you don't need to be spraying pesticides to get the end, res end result that you want. Um, but it requires, you know, more work and more research and um, thoughtfulness uh, as part of the process. And we've gotten lazy, you know. We just have, you know, you go pick up a bottle and you spray it and you don't worry about it. Yes, greenhouse. Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm a beekeeper, member of Long Island Beekeepers Association, Great. which has exploded with growth. Uh, we have uh, 350 members now, and the room is always filled. Uh, one of the things that we do is we bring in a lot of uh, major researchers, and the, the whole process is becoming much more scientific. Mm -hmm. uh, just a small retrospective of what's going on re in relation to your neighbors. I live near a farming area, uh, but uh, suburbia is just at the, approaching at the edge. And uh, last year I started out with three new beehives, uh, as is quite often the case, you do that at the beginning of a season, you might refresh it if you think that your queen is old. And as soon as I was done, I walked across the street and there's a property ringed in yellow uh, insecticide uh, banners across the street. Now, the decline of bees on Long Island started in the 1950s, and that was when uh, residential development took over, the more rural development. And the main crop in the spring is dandelions. And that's what was being killed over there. That was just in the spring, just at the cusp. 
So it's an uphill battle, and you feel good if you make it through one season, even if you don't aren't able to say, oh, yes, I got as far as getting honey. At least you're getting the population out there, and they're working very closely with local wildflower uh, organizations as well. Um, I had another thought, uh, perhaps as a way that we can uh, generate some... Uh, activity within the organizations that we have. We do have some leadership that could make that happen to collect some information for you. And I just want to ask you a question. The, the, the bee, bee um, keeper industry has been really concerned about neonicotinoids. Yeah. And you know, there's a great deal of science that shows that the decline um, in, in the bee population could be due to neonicotinoid exposure. Um, but of course, the corporations that are selling these uh, chemicals are saying, no, it's these mites, you know, that's affecting the bees, right? It's these problems. What, what is your feeling on that? Uh, I think it's the neonicotinoids. The neonics, yeah. yeah. Uh, what I saw in the book from Katie uh, Singer, who was here the, uh, a few days ago, uh, they also find that there's a problem with exposure to microwave uh, towers um, from the cell, right, yeah. so this, they're All bucking it things. in other directions. But people, and I talk about that a little bit in my book, Whitewash, um, people, it's not honey necessarily that we need to care about, but bees also are so important um, in pollination. They're pollinators, you know, of, yeah. Of, of other um, key foods. On so. the east end, there's a lot of people uh, just emphasizing uh, planting pollinator gardens. Take up your, your lawn and put down a variety of uh, yeah things that attract pollinating plants. The, the problem with glycof, uh, I'm not going to pronounce it correctly, is from what I understand, it leaches uh, a lot of uh, natural chemicals out of the soil, so that if, if we do come to an area where we could bring in more bi biological uh, controls, it will be decades before we can build up some of the natural richness in the soil. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that is definitely something that scientists have been looking at for many years is uh, the harmful impacts on the soil if you use glyphosate over and over again and uh, how it essentially does rob you of some pretty important nutrients. Um, you know, one interesting example I could give you, there's a USDA scientist who was working out of the University of Missouri uh, for USDA, and uh, he was studying the soil. He studied for 30 years, and he started seen real problems with glyphosate uh, impacts in the soil. Tried to write about it. This is a USDA scientist. And uh, I was talking to him about it, and he got in a whole lot of trouble and uh, was one of the many scientists who, you know, got suppressed and had his research censored. And uh, University of Missouri, it was ironic, his office looked, there was a window, and it looked right out on a giant auditorium named Monsanto Auditorium because they had given so much money to the university, yeah. Genetically modified, probably. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. Anybody else? Sorry. Yeah? How about... Right here or over here? It doesn't work anymore. <laughs> What's happened? Uh-oh. <laughs> Do you want to shout? Shout it out. Oh. Thank you for your wonderful work you've done in researching all this, and it's also quite dangerous for yourself and your family. Um, as I mentioned earlier in Caitlin's um, presentation, 
that um, the Swiss Federal Health Ministry released a study in 2013 that 92% of the toxins in our food are in the animal foods. And of the 92, 54 is in dairy as everything is stored in the mammary glands of a lactating mother cow. And that's actually what we're consuming when we consume dairy and drink mother's milk from a cow. So your examples only mention the, um, the oats, the fruits. I mean, we're only getting maybe, whatever, a dose of one chemicals in the oats and the fruits. But if we would consume like meat, dairy, eggs, it would be concentrated. And it depends on how high the animal is. In the f and fish is really, really bad, whether it's farmed offshore, on land, wild caught, it's everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, no, agreed. And if you if you look at the, if you're interested, I mean, you can get it. They are public, the FDA reports and USDA reports every year. They're very thick publications, and they do. They have, they they have all of the the meats and you know the animal products as well. I when I pull a graphic, I tend to just pull you know give you a, a little snippet of it. But but it is, and it's kind of alarming when you read through the the pesticide tolerances too, because they they do have them for you know, for meat that you're eating from, you know, an animal. If you're eating meat, there, there are levels of pesticides expected that our government expects to be in that meat. And we don't, you don't think about that, right? And the eggs and the milk and the, right. Um, so that was a good point. Thank you. Oh, this person has the mic, sorry. Yes. Documentary, Biosludge, by uh, Natural News about the politics behind uh, a waste system and uh, sewage processing, taking the toxins, everything out. And I wanted to know what kind of a threat if the glyphosate ended up in this system where the um, compost and everything produced out of the sludge were to get back into our into our crops and agriculture. How would that affect it? Or is, has it happened? And if not, how do we put, how do we prevent that from happening? Because that's a big problem with the bio sludge. I think, I mean, if I, well, yes, I mean, they, they fully expect, and, and there's a lot of anecdotal information about glyphosate, just as you've described, um, you know, showing up in, in, in compost or, or sludge or whatever you want to call it, and, and other chemicals, obviously, heavy metals um, and other environmental contaminants. Um, how do you avoid it? I mean... Right now, we have an EPA that is trying to roll back regulations as hard and as fast as they can. Um, and, you know, these are regulations that are designed to protect us. Now, they haven't necessarily been doing that great of a job anyway, but if you roll them back, you know, who knows what's going to happen. Um, so I think people just really need to be, as you are, informed and get engaged. And tell your friends, tell your neighbors, tell your relatives, whomever, you know, is energized and educated enough to spread the word and maybe it goes to Washington. I mean, I truthfully think the only way to really affect change in Washington, and this is for, you know, across the board, is to get the money out of politics. I don't think that we can allow giant corporations to spend millions and millions of dollars, you know, on lobbying lawmakers and getting, you know, their people elected and that sort of thing. Um, and and if we if we continue to allow that, this is what we're going to continue to have. I mean, these regulatory bodies are run by uh, appointed officials. Um, and so these politically appointed officials, you know, have to answer to politics, and that's what they do. And that's why they override these career scientists over and over again. It's a big, it's a big task, though. Yes. Is Monsanto still suing the smaller farmers for the... What is it called? The downwind, I guess. Yeah. yeah are they still getting away with it? I'm not aware of any active lawsuits right now, but they've certainly filed, you know, hundreds, I believe, of those against farmers around the world, and they generally win them, um, you know, for uh, patent infringement is what they're calling it, for the GM seeds you're talking about. Yeah. I know you have a question. Who's got the mic? <laughs> Hi. I... Because you were saying, what can we do? Oh, One of the things that I think we all can do, if you're not already members of Avaz, are you aware of that I'm aware of Avaz. organization? Mm -hmm. They are the international group, global group, that have managed 
A-V-A-A-Z, it's an international group promoting peace and power to the people and justice, social justice, justice, social and, justice yeah. and, and detoxification of our planet. Um, they have been instrumental in getting the European Union to at least begin to ban the glycophytes. Mm -hmm. Um, of course, Monsanto and Bayer are fighting that, but if we get involved, even at, at the online level and support them, then um, we can participate. Yeah, that's a good point. Are there, there other groups that you can suggest there, that we can join easily? I mean, Invaz is probably the biggest, right? I mean, right. there are several others. Center for Food Safety here in the United States has done really important work. They're a legal group. Um, that basically just tries to hold our regulators accountable to follow the law um, because and they've won several court cases where they found that the EPA and the USDA just kind of skirt the law in a lot of cases and hope nobody finds out. And so that, you know, that's a, a very important group. Um, you know, Pesticide Action Network is a good group. There are a lot of them out there doing work. Yes. Sierra Club. Sierra Club yeah, I mean, yeah. Yes. No. Yes. No. They do not want you to talk. Yeah. No. <laughs> um, I was so happy and inspired when Michelle, Michelle Obama started her garden in the White House, and uh, classes were organized to come, and children were learning to plant. Can you tell me what happened? What is the evolution of that? Are there still some remainders that are going on? And was it destroyed totally? Or I don't know. What, what? what room was, were they in when he had all the McDonald's hamburgers piled up and the fish sandwiches and the, you know, I don't know. I do not know about that, that garden um, and, that, and that program. I haven't heard anything about it. I don't know that it's been continued. Um, but obviously the organic industry is growing pretty dramatically and Food companies that I talk to, um, you know, are recognizing the trend, and they are recognizing. And I've, what they told me is that you know people got really worked up about GMOs and the, you know wanted non-GMO, and they were very concerned about that. And and they see now people being educated and concerned about pesticides in their foods. And the food companies are trying to get ahead of that, you know, and, and meet the consumer need and the demand. So. The more consumers become aware, and you vote with your pocketbook, the more the companies pay attention. Oh, that's a big controversial subject right now, isn't it, under the hydroponics? Uh, that's a whole other thing, and I have not gotten into the data enough. Um, but what's going on with the organic, and this is a whole other thing, with the organic industry, because of the growth and the demand, the big companies have started buying up the original mom and pop organic growers and organic companies, and they have taken um, positions on the board and they are, have been working to weaken the standards um, pretty significantly. Um, so you're seeing you know, a real battle over that now, and you're seeing an attempt to really erode the standards. And you've probably read about this, you know, but for instance, chickens, you know, they're supposed to have fresh air and sunlight and be able to scratch and you know, that sort of thing. And so what they've come up with is you know, it can be in a little cage and they can have a porch where they can kind of see the outside. and. Uh, you know, so they're, they're basically just trying to, again, have the organic label on their products, but be able to do, uh, you know, mass concentrated uh, agriculture, again, in a way that's not necessarily very sustainable. So we need to prote protect the organic standard for sure. Anybody else? I think it's dinner yes. time again. <laughs> the, um, it was a great present. It was, what you, everything you said was excellent, and I'm going to get your book. Thank but to you. answer um, your question about um, the farms that Michelle Obama um, initiated, yes, they're still going on because I'm a rural food chef, and they're going on, I'm pretty impressed, they're going on in projects in the Bronx. Okay, these people are making their organic food. I see more homeless people eating organic now, and they, I mean, if what you said, a lot of the food, the food is still sprayed and everything, but they're doing a lot better in these inner cities. And I teach raw foods all over because I certify people in raw food. 
and I work for the farmer's market in, um, in the Bronx. And they have their little garden, and they have all these. Um, now I'm, I brought in 5G, and as, she, as this lady said, we need, to get, we need to not just talk about it. We need to get, go, we need to get it in our community. We need to call up um, the, the right um, people and talk about it. Tell them how we feel. Make your own community. Make it your own. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. I think we're supposed to, Steve wanted me to stop at 5.30. I think we're over, unless somebody has some pressing question. No? Yes? Two? Two more? Are there two more out there? Maybe not. Yes? No? What? Question. Actually, it's not a question. Uh, I'm, uh, I want to tell them we should start from ourselves. We talk about big organizations right now. For example, everybody here keeps their lawn green and nice. And to order to do this, they just like uh, spray their lawns with chemicals and pollute their water. And yeah. it affects them, their children, their pets. And I stop by my choice. I stop to put chemicals in my lawn probably 10 years ago. I have done the lines. My yeah. neighbors hate me, I can tell you. I try to cut it. However, I love this done the lines. We need to do something about this. I know green lawn is beautiful, however. No, right, I mean, that's a good point. And that's why you're seeing um, there's organic weed killers that uh, you know are coming to market. People are doing a lot of research because they know that there's that demand out there. And these landscaping companies, you know, they're coming up with all these innovative ways to be organic. Um, but yeah, you're probably, my own lawn, I know, like the dandelions. <laughs> but I just can't bring myself to, you know, I used to use Roundup. I used to, I loved it, you know, it was great. It worked really great. And then I started doing all the research and learning everything about it. And you know, if you want to use it, use it, but the dermal absorption of glyphosate, if you're gonna use it, you need gloves and long pants and shoes and a respirator, you know, you need to protect yourself because that's one of the things in the internal documents that have come out is the rate of dermal absorption because of the surfactants that they use it, it, to help it, it essentially gets into your skin and then gets into your bloodstream, uh, just like it adheres and gets into the, the tissues of the plant. So. You know, that's one thing. If Monsanto would have been honest about the risks and, um, you know, and, and alerted people, if you want to use this, use it, but do it very cautiously. And, of course, that's not what they did. You know, safe enough to drink, safe as table salt. There's some great documents from late 1970s, I think they are, in the EPA archives, where their scientists, again, are saying to Monsanto, we really think it needs to say danger on the label because of these different reasons. And Monsanto saying, yeah, no, we're not doing that. We're not putting that on our label. They ended up going with caution, I think it was, or, or warning. But, you know, time and time again, the message has been to suppress uh, the risk. So you need to protect yourself. Anything else? Yeah, one more. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say one thing. I think periodically we need to detox our system. Right. Detox our system periodically. Yeah, everything. That can go for everything, right? Our bodies, our political system, our environment, everything. So we have a great vegan meal, right? Dinner is hopefully pesticide-free. They're ignoring me. All right. Thank you very much.